We've been talking the last few weeks about making a difference. And last week, we talked about little David and how that when he went down to take his brother some food, which if I was down in a foxhole somewhere hiding, I'd appreciate a sandwich myself, but they didn't see it that way whenever he spoke up against the Philistine that they was hiding from. Made them look bad is really what it did. Amen. There they were, these big, brawny, muscular guys, you know, and here come this little squirrely brother of theirs. Won't know what they're doing hiding. So it made them look bad and made them feel ashamed. Amen. So they lash out against him, and David makes this statement, what we talked about last week, the question, is there not a cause? And that's what we talked about. It's in 1 Samuel, the 17th chapter. We didn't get done. We did just about finish up on David, but that left us with about five pages of notes that we're going to try to finish up this morning. We've been talking about the difference that each one of us can make. We were talking about the difference that David made. Here this little shepherd boy, armed only with a sling, as the songwriter wrote, and he had been out there with his sheep on the hillside and singing psalms and praises to God and writing some of the most beautiful things that were ever written that we still cherish and hold dear today as the Word of God. And He goes down there and uh, you know you would think by looking around, King Saul's down there. He's head and shoulders above every man in Israel. and His brothers are down there. And a lot of big warrior type men are down there. And you would think if you was sitting back and seeing the entire view of it, you see this little shepherd boy coming down out of the hills, you know, and getting the little sandwich bags there, whatever he had, the meat and the cheese, and heading down toward the battle. You would think, well, that's insignificant. That's just some little runt taking them something to eat. But in reality, that was God's war. Oh, my goodness, that was God's warrior right there. That would be the one that made the difference in this situation. He goes down there, and the Israelites are hiding from the Philistines, and he says, who is this uncircumcised? Philistine that defies the army of the living God. And we all know the rest of the story as Paul Harvey used to say. Some of them heard David speaking and heard his, his bravery and his boldness and they go and they tell it to King Saul. The Bible says they rehearse it in the presence of King Saul. We need some people that have rehearsed some good things. You know, we're always hearing from people that overheard something that somebody said. And it's usually not good stuff. But on this occasion, they run and tell King Saul, hey, there's somebody down there that actually sounds like they might take a stand against this man, this Philistine. So they go and they rehearse in the ears of King Saul, and King Saul says, bring him to me. Let me see him. David stands and testifies before the king that God, that his Lord, is more than able to deliver into his hand the Philistine, just as he delivered in his hand the bear and the lion and the enemies that would come out against his flock, how that he had proved that God was more than enough, Brother Sleese, and he knew that God was more than enough in this situation. First thing that Saul wants to do is arm him with his armor. He says, here, put this stuff on. You can't go and face this man without this, this, uh, this, uh, this artillery and without this weaponry, without this armor that I'm going to put on you. David puts it on, and since King Saul is head and shoulders above every man in Israel, David can't stand the weight of the stuff. He's stacking around there, and he says, Oh, I can't go in this. It's too heavy. He says, I haven't proved it. I've proved God. Amen. Hallelujah. Listen, you can try to get me to do things in a different way, in a different fashion, but i got news for you today. I've tried God. Amen. Hallelujah. I know He works. I know religion don't. Amen. I know denominationalism 99.9% .9 of the time does not work, but God works. So David goes out there and he defeats the giant. We know that. He hits him in between the eyes with a stone, knocks him down. This one boy makes all the difference in the world. Now he could have thought to himself, and this is what we usually think. We look around and we see people that are, we think, that are better equipped for this situation. Yeah. We see people that we think are more talented than we are. We see people that we think are more learned and they're, they're more qualified for the job that God wants done. Amen? So we don't do anything because we don't feel like we can. God's trying to drill into our hands the last few weeks. 
We can do something. We can make a difference. We are a light in a lost and dying world, a dark place. And if we let that light shine, if we'll allow others to see our good works, it will, then, then our Father which is in heaven will be glorified. We have to realize we can make a difference. We can sit on our hands and say, I couldn't do nothing. And we'll be like the man that the Bible speaks of, that the, the king that gave out the talents, and the one took his and buried it in the dirt. And when it came reckoning time, when he stood before the king, all he had to offer was that which had been given to him that he refused to use. That's the way, that's the way with a lot of people today. We have to realize we've been given something. And it's our responsibility to use it. To be a light to a lost and dying world. To shine forth into the darkness of others the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. The message of the Word of God. The Word of Truth that Brother Sleaze was talking about today. Right here, no other. Amen? The Word of God. Sharing that with others. Allowing our life to be taken over and as a vessel to be lived through, loved through by Jesus Christ. So to say that you can't make a difference today because you're small in number or because you're not a, a very educated person, history is full of people that were not educated people that made a difference. The Word of God is full of people and examples that were not educated people. We're not from royal bloodline. They were not the cream of the crop, as we would say today. They, some, of them were, some of them were far less. All of them were far less than perfect. But you find in all of them, when you look down through the annals of history and through the work pages of the Word of God, you find a heart that is willing, a man that is willing, a woman that is willing to go against the flow and stand in the midst of controversy and say, I will make a difference. There's something I can do. Each one of us need to make a difference. We can make a difference. Amen. So there is a cause today, and we talked about last week how that the cause, the purpose, the reason is not to build fancier churches. Not to have bigger denominations. Not to have a, a, a kingdom here on earth, as it were. The cause today is souls. It has always been souls. But we've lost sight of that. The church, instead of having a vision to reach out beyond their four walls and reach the lost and reach those that are that sit in darkness and compel them to come to the light or to let their light shine so that those that do sit in darkness see the light and run to the light and recognize there is a light, we've decided to sit within our four walls and build bigger churches. And have bigger, have recreational halls and bigger fellowship halls and do great and glorious things. There is nothing more great, nothing more glorious today than sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world. There is nothing more important today than letting your light shine before men so that they'll see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. It's your time to make a difference. And you can do that. You are the light of the world. That's what Jesus spoke. He said, you're the light of the world. So let your light shine before men so that they'll see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. People ought to be able to see Jesus in you. People ought to be able to see that light in you. People ought to be able to tell that you are different, that something is different in your life whenever storms and troubles and heartaches are abound as it seems they do today. They should know, hey, he's got something. He's solid. They're saying it. People shouldn't have to hear you say, well, I'm about to give up. I don't think I'm going to go on any farther. Amen? If I ever have those thoughts, I just don't share them with nobody. Amen? Just me and Jesus. All the ones that knows about that stuff. Because in a day where everything else seems unstable, where it seems like the government is a mess, and it is a mess, and not just ours, but all around the world, people need to know there is something that does not change. And that something is a someone. And that someone is is Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Government changes. People change. Your relatives will change. Your mom will change. Your daddy will change. You'll change. But Jesus doesn't change. His Word does not change. His Word is the same as it's always been. And He's telling us, 
in these last days. Now is not the time to build a kingdom on earth. Now is the time to stand like John the Baptist did and say, Behold, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Now is the time not to point to our self-centered gospel, but to point to the gospel, Jesus Christ, Him crucified, and His power to save, heal, and deliver. And that there is no other way. This past week, we received a letter. We received two letters, actually. One of them was real favorable. One of them was from a woman in Georgia. She said her and her husband, every Sunday morning, Listen to the program. And they love it. The other one was not so favorable. It was from a man up in Illinois who didn't like something that I said. It was a couple of Sundays ago now, I guess. Because I mentioned a particular denomination. Because instead of, uh, uh, instead of glazing over it, instead of just saying a certain whatever, I had the audacity to mention the name. Of the organ of the of the denomination of the religious organization, whatever. You know that I didn't start preaching yesterday. Y'all know that, right? Mm -hmm. If there's one thing I've learned, I've learned a lot of things. But if there's one thing I've learned, no matter how you say it or what you say, somebody's going to be offended. Mm -hmm. I have tiptoed around. I have tiptoed through the tulips. <laughs> I have handled people with kid gloves, and they still got mad. Truth anyway. Amen. Truth anyway. But the said truth anyway. Yeah. So I have learned. Now, could I be more tactful? Certainly. I'm not the most tactful preacher you're ever going to find. Could I use more wisdom? I'm not the smartest preacher you're ever going to find. Amen. But you'll be hard pressed to find a preacher that has as much zeal for the truth as I have. And I could have said it in a different way. But I have learned, and I'll write that man back this week. Not to compromise, but because now I have the opportunity to share with him more of the truth. Mm -hmm. yeah. Amen? Yeah. If I'd have glazed over it, if I'd have just breezed past it, I'd have never heard from him. Yeah. He would have right along in the same thing that he's in now. Mm -hmm. But now, God has opened the door. Mm -hmm. Even if it was a notice on my part, God used it. Mm -hmm. Now I have the opportunity to tell him why I said what I said. Mm -hmm. Amen? So I've learned... It doesn't matter how you say it. Somebody somewhere is going to be offended. <clears throat> somebody somewhere is not going to lie. I tried playing that game. It didn't work for me. I tried pleasing everybody and couldn't do it. Amen? Couldn't please everybody. Well, not stick with the truth. And not stick with the truth. Yeah. And even that, then people blame me for compromising. They blame you for, you know, if, if you preach it too hard and you got people get offended because of that. If you don't preach it hard enough, you got people get offended because you're compromising. Mm -hmm. So you just got to do what you got to do to please the Lord. And if you goof up, say, Lord, forgive me. Try to make it right. You know, try to explain the situation and go on. But my point is this. Hearing from other people, some good reports, some bad reports, but let you know you're making a difference in one way or the other. Amen. Yeah. You're making a, you're, you're, you're doing something. Mm -hmm. Amen? Mm -hmm. Instead of just sitting by doing nothing. You can make a difference today. I want to talk about Jesus. I want to talk about a situation where we find Him in. Let me find you the Scripture. In John, the fourth chapter. <clears throat> Last week we talked about, is there not a cause? Today we're going to talk about that there is something we must needs do. And it's not to be able to don't get on the edge of your seat and say, oh yeah, we're fixing to have a fun drive to build a fellowship hall. I'd like to have a big fellowship hall. We're going to have a fun drive to build a big building. I'd like to have a big building. But those things are not at the top of my list today. At the top of my list is reaching as many people as we can before we get out of here with the truth of the Word of God. John, the fourth chapter and the fourth verse, we find Jesus going out of His way to do something. We find Jesus, the Word of God makes this statement about Him. It says in John, the fourth chapter, in the fourth verse, and He must needs go through Samaria. Now many learned, more learned men than I am, more seasoned scholars than I am will tell you that their opinion is that the reason He had to go through Samaria 
is because he simply had no other choice unless he wanted to take the long way around. Well, let me tell you something. If you want to know why he went through Samaria, all we got to do is read a little bit farther in this chapter. Amen? We don't have to try to analyze it, you know, and figure it out. We don't have to look at the map and see where he was at and where he was going and what was the easiest and simplest route. Listen, it was not a, it was not a pleasant thought for a Jew to go through Samaria. Amen? These people, the Jewish people and the Samaritans were not friends. Amen? It would be worth his while to take longer to get around to where he was going. Yeah. Amen? But he decides that he's got to go. He's compelled. He must needs go through Samaria. And we'll find out. And it won't take very long. In the fifth verse, still in John the fourth chapter, it says, Then cometh he to the city of Samaria. Now he's in enemy territory here. Listen, for us to reach some people, we're going to have to get out of our comfort zone. Yeah. Amen. We're going to have to go, we might have to get in some dangerous situations. Amen. Whether spiritually or physically or whatever the case may be, you may have to go through the you may have to go through the, the, uh, the, uh, the valley of the shadow of death. Amen. To get a hold of some people. There, you may have to get out of your comfort zone. You may not be able to stay in the same place of comfortableness that you've been. Jesus finds himself in the middle of enemy territory knowing this. He goes on through there anyway. And this is why. This is why right here. It says, Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well. And it was about the sixth hour. Now what do we have here? We have the Word of God telling us that Jesus must needs go through Samaria. Now we're trying to find out, well, why? What was the reason? We know that there was an alternate route. It would have took him longer to get there. But he wouldn't have had to go through Samaria, the land of the enemy. The land where you know, he's putting his life in danger, the life of his disciples in danger, to go through this territory. And I can imagine the conversation the boys had over this. Amen? Yeah. Don't he know that ain't a safe place for us to go? Amen? But he must needs go, and not only does he go, but he says, you know what, I think I'll sit down and stay a few minutes. Amen. See, he's got an appointment. Oh, you think out there today you're listening to this radio program, you think you just happened to turn it on. Amen. No, God had an appointment for you and us today. Amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah. He's got an appointment. He's waiting. He's waiting on somebody. Amen. So not only, he don't just go through Samaria and hurry through it, you know. Let's hurry up. The enemy's going to get us. Let's get on. You know, you, you, sometimes you just press on through because it's better that you just get out of that place. But he says, no, I think I'm going to sit down here and rest. Let's find out why he goes through Samaria. Let's find out what the need is today. He didn't go through Samaria to build a church. He didn't go through Samaria to <clears throat> get on the good side of the enemy. Listen to what happens. Verse 7, There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. And Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. Oh, my goodness. The Bible says, For his disciples were gone away to the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest me, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews, listen to me, have no dealings with the Samaritans. Did you hear that? Verse 10, Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked him, and he would have given thee living water. Now, listen up, scholars. Listen up, Bible uh, 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 theologians out there. Now we find why Jesus must needs go through Samaria. Why Jesus must needs sit on the well. Someone sent me a friend request almost been a couple of weeks ago now and they thought I was somebody else had the same name they thought was from Missouri or somewhere. When they found out that I wasn't, they apologized. But I kept them on my list anyway even though I didn't know them. A few days later after hearing some of our preaching and seeing some of the things that we were posting, they said, now I know that it wasn't a mistake that we got together. I said, no, I don't believe in mistakes. If for no other reason, God allowed our paths cross so that we could pray for one another, so that we could encourage one another. See, things don't just happen 
happen. It didn't just happen that Jesus was sitting here when that woman came that day as she usually does with her bucket to get some water from the well. No, there was an appointment made in heaven. Hallelujah. There was a lost woman that had been searching for truth, searching for answers, and Jesus had an appointment with her. That's why He must needs go through Samaria. There are people out there today that it has been ordained from headquarters, and I'm talking about heaven, that they have an appointment with you. God's going to allow your path to cross their path. He might even allow them to come across you when you're not in a comfortable situation. When things in your life are not going just as smooth, Sister Amy, as you want them to go. And that's the time that you're supposed to offer them that living water. Oh, this woman comes just like she always does. She thought it's just another trip to the well. <laughs> oh, my, my, my. How many people just going through the motions of their everyday life just think everything's going to be the same way that it always is. Amen? And in God has a divine appointment for them. He sends one of His lights, my, 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 to cross paths with them. Amen? Hallelujah. And here is the light, Jesus Christ, sitting on the well, and He's fixing to talk to this woman. This is the reason that He went. Amen? The people in India, that's why we do what we do. The man that wrote this week that wants answers to why I said what he's why we do what we do. The woman from Georgia, she's why we do what we all of them that we hear from those are reasons amen those are the ones that we're trying to get to the, the, the truth to those are the reasons amen that Jesus came they are the ones that he left us and said hey go out and be the light you're supposed to go out and let your light shine before me and let them see me in you go out and take the truth of the gospel amen to those that are lost and undone to those that are weary to the, we, we reach a lot of people that they're not lost. Amen. They're saved people. But saved people need encouragement. Amen. Saved people need the Word of God. Church people, people that are faithful to the Lord need uplifting with the Word of God. They need to be fed. And in many cases, they're not being fed where they're at. They need to hear the truth. And in many cases, they're not hearing the truth where they're at. Amen. What I'd like to know, and I posed this question to you before, but what's wrong with being right? Amen. Where did we come to the place in our nation, in the church? Let's forget about the world and the way the shape it's in. Let's forget about America for a second. Forget about the shape she's in. And let's talk about the church. When did you become the odd man out because you stand for something that's in the word of truth? Amen. When did you become the odd man out? The, 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 the weirdo or the one that sticks out amongst the crowd whenever you actually stand for something instead of falling for everything that the world has to offer. Somewhere we crossed the line. Amen? Somewhere the church decided that being right wasn't all that important. That living right wasn't all that important. That standing for the truth wasn't all that important. You might have decided that, but God hasn't. God has it. It's as important as it's ever been. It's as important today for you to shine your light as it's ever been. As a matter of fact, the darker it gets, the more important your light becomes. Amen? The darker it gets, the more important it is for you to let your light shine. The woman says to him in verse 11, <clears throat> Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself, and his children, and his cattle? <laughs> Are you greater than him? Oh my goodness, she didn't know she was talking to the I am that I am. Amen. Hallelujah. Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give, that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. You see, there's the message. Jesus, He said, the water that you offer, they'll thirst again. And that's the way it is today. Most of the things that are offered over the pulpits in our nation today, and that's where I lay the biggest part of the blame, 
He's with the preachers that climbed behind the pulpit this morning and preached a big bag of mess. Amen. But most of it, it doesn't. It, all it does is quench their thirst like water does yours. Later on, they're thirsty again. Amen. It doesn't do anything for them. It's just something to appease their flesh or their, their thirst for only a little while. But Jesus said, if you get a hold of this water, oh my, my, my. It won't just take care of your thirst, but it'll be inside of you a well springing up. Amen. Into living waters. That's the gospel. Jesus is the gospel. Let let me see if I can put it more tactful for you today if you're out there listening. Any doctrine, any do denomination, any teaching that takes you away from the fact that Jesus Christ is the only way to get to heaven, that the blood is the only way to be saved, is leading you in the wrong direction and will take you to hell. I didn't write the words that Jesus spoke. In the book of John when he said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. I didn't write it. Oh, I can preach it today. I'll exhort it. I'll, I'll tell it to you today. I didn't write it though. If you want to complain to the author, you're going to have to talk to God. Amen. He is the way. The only way. I like what Brother Sweet said this morning. He said he got it from me and I'll get it from him. It's the blood plus nothing. It's the blood plus nothing. Not your rituals. Not your works. Not your righteousness or goodness that you think you may have. It's His blood plus nothing. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth, oh, whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world but that through Him the world might be saved through Jesus. That's the only way. I, I, I don't want to offend you today. But if the truth offends you, I, I, I can't apologize for that. Jesus is the only way. And that's what He's telling this woman at the well. This is the reason He's going through Samaria. This woman probably done hurt some other doctrines. This woman probably done hurt. She hadn't lived as long as she I don't know how old she was, but she done had five men in her life. Amen. So unless she was one swinging Jesse, she'd been around for a while. I mean, all how old she was. She'd been around long enough to hear some stories. She'd been around long enough to hear some doctrine. She'd been around long enough to hear some of the other religions. Amen. Jesus is speaking something to her here. Oh, my goodness. And he, listen to what he says. He's fixing to read her mail. Do you like it whenever God reads your mail? Amen. He can do it like nobody else can. Amen. He says, if, you, if they drink of the water that you have here out of this well... They'll thirst again. But whosoever shall drink of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water, not only that, this water will be a spring. It'll spring up inside of you. Amen. It'll trickle over. Not just in you, but it'll trickle over into other people's lives. It'll, it'll get other people wet. Amen. It ain't just for you. My, my, my. It'll, it'll spring up. Amen. Sometimes we've took the kids to places that we've been with them and they, they had these things, these water that spews up out of the ground. Amen. It didn't just come up and get you wet, but it spreads out and it gets others wet. It gets by. That's what happened. Amen. My, my, my. Some people don't like that. They're like a cat you take and throw in the water. They get mad and get out and shake off and go run somewhere and try to hide till they get dry. But then get other people wet. Amen. This well will be inside of you. This water will turn into a well that will spring up into everlasting water. It'll give life to other people. Amen. Oh, we ain't talking about just some ordinary water, but that's what the church is offering today. The church is offering ordinary water that'll make you thirst again. But if we can get a hold of Jesus, if we can get back to the cross today, we can offer them something that'll leave them different than they were. This woman was about to change. This woman was about to be different than she'd been before she came to the well. Amen. You know, sometimes you have an appointment with a doctor and you leave either in worse shape than you were when you came or no better off. This woman was fixing to get what she needed to fix her life. And Jesus said unto her, Go call thy husband. Oh, I will skip verse 15. The woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not. She still hadn't quite got it yet, but she's about to. That I don't have to come here to draw, neither come hither to draw. And Jesus saith unto her, Go and call thy husband and come hither. You hear that? Jesus had her chart there. You, you had an appointment with a doctor before when you go in and you're sitting there waiting and waiting and waiting. 
He'll come in and he'll have your chart. And they start flipping through the papers. You know, that's what Jesus had. He had a chart. He said, go get your husband. Uh, <clears throat> the woman answered and said, I have no husband. <laughs> and Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband. For thou hast had five husbands. And she must have been shacking up because it says, And he whom thou now hast is not thy husband. In that saidst thou truly. Amen. Now the woman thinks he's a prophet. Because he can tell her what her life is. Verse 25 says, The woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. And Jesus, Jesus saith unto her, Now here's the message. Oh, don't miss this. I that speak unto thee am he. Mm -hmm. Not Muhammad. <clears throat> not Harry Krishna. Not William Brannan. Branham. I just made some people mad. Jesus. He said, I am the Messiah. I'm the one you've been waiting for. I'm the answer you've been looking for. You've been sitting somewhere thinking, well, one day to come, one day to come. Somebody needs to tell you it's already here. <laughs> you don't have to sit around and wait for the rapture. Amen. Somebody needs to tell you he's here. He's here. All you got to do is open up your heart and let him in. You can. You don't have to wait till you get to the other side to experience joy. You don't have to wait till you get to the other side to at least experience peace. You can experience it here. Oh my goodness. Hallelujah. I'm so glad this morning I didn't have to have a nerve pill to go to sleep last night. I'm so glad this morning I didn't have to have a pill to get me going this morning. I'm glad this morning that I know where my peace comes from. Brother Mike preached Tuesday night and it was a simple message, two words. God is. Amen. I told him I might have to preach that. Hallelujah. God is my peace. He is my joy. He is my salvation. He is my Savior. He is a rewarder of those that diligently seek Him. He is the way. He is the truth he is the life Jesus Christ he's the Messiah many Jews today still looking for the Messiah he's already came he's already made the way listen to this what happens to this woman when she hears this go down to verse 28 I was going to hit on with the disciples here well let's go ahead and read verse 27 y'all in no hurry and upon this came his disciples and marveled that he talked with the woman. Yet no man said, What seekest thou? Or why talkest thou with her? But that's what they were thinking. That's where the church is. Some of the big Ikes might have drove by here this morning. And if they'd have seen how many cars were out front or seen how many people came in for service, they might have thought, Well, what's the use? Amen. What are you even doing that for? His disciples might have thought that too. Why in the world is he talking to her? I read this this week, and I, actually I didn't read it. Somebody shared it over a radio program over the station. I want to share it with you. This is why it's important for you to understand that it's not in the numbers. We, I want to reach as many people as we can, don't get me wrong, but if we lose sight of reaching the one, if we get our vision to where that it's only for the masses and not for the one, then we've missed it too. This man said that many years ago in rural, England, in rural England, a preacher found himself scheduled to preach in an obscure village. But a storm was raging. It was so bad that he wondered if he should even go. But he decided to go on. But his doubt about the evening grew. When he got to the place where they were going to be holding the meeting, there was only one person that showed up because of the bad weather. But instead of just Closing up and going on, he went ahead and preached the message to the woman as if the building had been full. Now listen to me. After that, he did not return to that region for many years. But when he did return to the place where he'd been before, he found in that area, in a place that had no churches when he was there years before, in almost every little community, there was a little church. And he discovered that the audience of one that he had decided to go ahead and preach to that night had got saved that night and had became an evangelist and had, been a, and had been evangelizing in that area all those years while he was gone. 
and all those little churches were because this man, that this one man decided to go ahead and press through and reach anyway. And when he got there, there's not but one, but he decided to go ahead and preach anyway. And that one that, oh my Lord, that one that got saved is the one that went out and reached many. So you see today how that your decision not to reach one affects many. We were scheduled to preach an outside revival several years ago in Lamasco, Kentucky. Y'all have heard me tell it before, but we've got a lot of <coughs> listeners that didn't, haven't heard it. We scheduled it for the first weekend in October. Because most of the time, at least it seemed like it used to be anyway, the first part of October was nice weather. <clears throat> that was the quickest we could get to it because we were holding other services. So we scheduled an outside three-night revival in Lamasco, Kentucky, the first weekend of October. Weather reports started coming in. We started looking at the forecast that they were saying it was going to be the coldest weekend of the year since the, since the following winter. <clears throat> since the winter before that. Said one night it was supposed to be 32 degrees. So there we, we're trying to decide, well, should we cancel this thing? Should we go ahead and go? We decide to go ahead and go. And we get there the first night, it's 32. The next night, it's 28 degrees. And we're outside. Brother Winford and them came up and they played music. I don't know if they wore the gloves while they played, but they wore them up until that time. <clears throat> when we put up the tapes and things that night, we had to brush the frost off the top of the CDs. I don't think we had CDs at the time. It was cassette tapes. And we might have had one or two people come out in the, the funeral home, came out and set up a tent like they do at the graveyards. Keep the wind off of people. So we might have had one or two besides the people that wanted us to come and hold it. But every night that we preached, there was a little boy on a bicycle and he would ride around <coughs> from one of the houses there in the area. And he would ride up and down the street there and he would ride around there in the yard. But we preached the first night, didn't see nobody get saved. We preached the second night. Didn't see nobody get saved. We preached the third night and as we were closing in and we were having the final altar call, the little boy that had been riding his bicycle rode up there and he got off of his bicycle and he walked over to the altar and he knelt down on his knees and he ex accepted Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. Now I don't know. I can tell you today that all of the effort, all of the code, all of the work was worth it to me to reach one soul. And if that's as far as it went, then I give glory to God for that because you cannot put a price on that one soul. But how do I know that that little boy didn't get up from that altar oh, with, that, with Jesus inside of him and grow up to be an evangelist and sharing the gospel with other people that are getting saved still today? All because we went ahead and had revival that winter weekend in October in Lamasco, Kentucky. Mm -hmm. It's important that you reach people. Even if it's just one, you have no idea of the results of that. Jesus goes and He reaches and I'm closing. I can't get it all in today. But I want to get you the most important part. Jesus must need to go through Samaria. He reaches this little woman. After he reveals to her that he's the Messiah, oh, I skipped this part. I was going to preach to you about the disciples. That's how I got off on that other stuff. You see, that's what you do when you get older. Your mind gets scattered. The disciples, they didn't ask him what's he doing talking to the woman. They was thinking it. And it says that therefore said the disciples one to another, Hath any man brought him aught to eat? This is verse 33. And it says that Jesus said unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. You see, that should be our goal today. Our goal today should be, should be the, to do the will of him that sent us, that told us to be the light, and to finish his work, taking the gospel, his message, the message of Jesus, to the ends of the world taking the gospel to every creature. This woman, 
when she hears that Jesus is the Messiah, the Bible says she left her water pot and she went her way into the city and said to the men, listen to that, she saith to the men, now listen, Jesus reaches her. She leaves her water pot at the well. She's so excited. She goes into the city and she shares it with the men there. What happens? The Bible says many of them believed because of her word, her testimony. This one woman that Jesus goes out of his way to reach, she goes and shares what Jesus shared with her. And many believed because of her testimony. Others that didn't believe then came out and heard Jesus and believed because of his word. It's important today that you know the difference you can make even if it's in a single solitary life that the influence does not stop there. They go and they reach others. And then they go and they reach others. And then they go and they reach others. It's important today that you know that it's, you can make a difference. That if you let your light shine, it does not stop there. When you show others the way, when you show others the way, they in turn show others the way. And they show others the way. And they show others the way. That's why it's important to be steadfast in your faith. To let your light shine before men. So that they can know this Jesus that we talk about. It's so far back now, I don't even remember what sermon we were talking about, but one of the reasons the Lord led us in this direction or sparked this in me was the man that was from Asia that was on the talk show on the radio. And he was talking about how commercialized America was and how the church had become so commercial and self-centered. Y'all remember me talking about that? He was talking about during the break there on the radio program, he had listened to the commercials and he said there was commercials about losing weight, commercials about having nicer hair. He said all the commercials were self-centered. And he said that's the way the churches became today. Self-centered. We must realize it's not all about us. We must realize that we are supposed to be His light, His vessel, His hand extended here on earth. My goodness. Out of all the scriptures I can close with, I couldn't think of one any better than this. I'm not going to read it, but I'm going to elaborate on it. Matthew, the 25th chapter. Several verses there. The Bible says, When the Son of Man shall come in His glory, all of the holy angels with Him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory, and before him shall he get shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divided the sheep and his goats. So the Bible says he'll set the sheep on his right hand, and on his right hand, and the goats on his left. Then he begins to say something peculiar to them. He turns to the goats and he says, I was hungry, you fed me not. I was sick and you didn't visit me. I was in prison and you didn't visit me. He says, I was naked and you didn't clothe me. And they turned to him in, in turn saying, well, when did we see you naked? When did we see you hungry? When did we see you destitute in prison? He said, if you've done it unto the least of these, you've done it unto me. He turns to the sheep, he says the same thing to them. And he tells them that because you've done it to the least of these, you've done it unto me. I've got a message for you today. If you refuse to reach out to the lost, you refuse to reach out to Jesus. If you've done it unto the least of these, you've done it unto me. If you refuse to let you, if you refuse to let your light shine, you refuse to let your light shine for Him. If you've done it unto the least of these, you've done it unto me. If you refuse to be compassionate, if you refuse to be caring and loving for a world that's lost and undone, you refuse to be caring and compassionate and loving to Jesus because He said, if you've done it to the least of these, you've done it to me. When you shut up your bowels of compassion. A good preacher friend of mine wrote me this week and said some of his followers, since Obama won the election, some of his, some of his uh, supporters, not followers, have said they can no longer support him because they're too worried about their finances. If we've ever needed to support ministries like his and like this one that's preaching the truth, we need to support it today. Amen. If we have to get rid of our satellites, if we have to get rid of our cable, if we have to get rid of our soft drinks, do something besides cutting off the purse strings to the work of God. Because souls are lost, hungry and dying for the truth. And they're dying and going to a devil's hell. And we have the answer. 
Under the least of these, if you've done it unto them, you've done it unto me. There's something we must needs do today, and that is share the gospel. Share Jesus with the world. That's the difference that you can make. You can make a difference right where you're at with those that you come in contact with by letting your light shine before them. Someone else have something this morning.